Hello, everybody. We would like to start. <laughs> yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the, what was it called, in the con uh, conversation with Brian Gibson about the development process of his amazing game, Thumper. Uh, just a short introduction. Um, I would like to sh shortly state that this talk or is this conversation is a part of the exhibition which you can see at the Habentaucher uh, uh, and it extends uh, somehow the, the exhibition there. So maybe the question also for you, who did see it? Okay, that, that sounds great. <laughs> And we, we can dive deep into the into certain details. If you have not seen it, I really highly recommend it to look at it afterwards because I really highly think deeply think that it adds to what we will talk here about today. Uh, I'm really happy that Brian is with me. He is like the one half of the development team of the of the game, uh, responsible for for m more the music and art aspects. He is a musician, plays since a lot of years uh, uh, in a band and uh, also like uh, artist and graphic designer and uh, animation designer and also a lot of side projects which I found very interesting to look at. Uh, and shortly also for, for, for the whole event, uh, yeah, the idea is to talk about the, 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 the development process of the game. Um, and uh, maybe two things additionally uh, about the whole event. Uh, as I said, it's, it's a part of this, of this uh, uh, exhibition also, and uh, I would like to uh, shortly also say that uh, the exhibition was, uh, it's a very unique thing that we are just trying out, and uh, we have like the third iteration of it right now, but it was much slower before, or, or, or smaller before, and this is the first time that we have it in a more extended way with the exhibition, and I'm uh, highly, highly, highly interested in some kind of feedback about the exhibition and the whole thing, how you think and what you think about uh, exhibiting such a game development process and how you think and uh, what, what you think about this. Um, yeah, shortly about me, I'm, my name is John Gorbaranyai and I'm, uh, I used to be a game designer a long time ago, but right now I'm a professor of game design here at the BTK Berlin. And I would also like to thank all the students who are with me today and also co-organized and co-curated co the whole event and the whole uh, uh, exhibition with me. So really, thanks. <laughs> um, just as a short introduction into the topic, uh, I would like to show you a video which... Uh, We have just seen seven years of development of a game <laughs> and uh, that would also, I mean, that's like, an, for me at least, an obvious first question, but how can you be into the development of a game during, of, of seven years without losing the concentration and without... Uh, without, uh, what kind of, of, of vision did you had in the beginning, which you are still see in the game now? And what was it, what, what, what kind of, yeah, what, what, what kind of uh, thing helps you <laughs> during seven years? Uh, yeah, that, I mean, there's, there's a few, a few things. Um, I mean, one big part of it, 
uh, for me was frustration and having a rough time at my job in as a professional game developer working at a at a company and having a very limited um, role in games and not feeling like I was participating in the full scope and the design like I didn't feel like I had much influence over the design decisions that were being made I worked at a uh, Harmonix which uh, is a company that made um, Guitar Hero and Rock Band and I was an effects artist and <clears throat> learned everything I know about video games while working there but um, and I, I'm eternally indebted to them for that but at the same time, I, a lot of what motivated me over the years was just uh, this feeling like there's something I want to see that I'm not seeing, and, there's, and I can't even convince. You know, you, if you have a game idea, and maybe I'm sure all of you, if you're interested in game development, you've had this experience, but if you try to communicate uh, what you're passionate about or an idea that you're interested in, into other people, it's kind of like um, it's kind of like trying to describe a dream you had, and it's one of those things that you can never quite people will never quite understand what you're trying to say, and until you actually do the real thing, and and the same it goes the other way, it works the other way, where if people like tell you a game idea that they're excited about, usually I'm just totally dismissive because I'm like I just. I have to see what you're talking about. If you just tell me, I could I could be thinking of a million different things. So um, I think I think for me it was like I just you know there's there were certain things I wanted to see and there were exper there were experiments that I wanted to do and I wasn't able to do them and I was really driven by that frustration and kind of <laughs> I mean it sounds dark but it's it's um, it's kind of true like there's this feeling like um, there's just something that is missing and I wanted to see if I could make it happen. And more specifically, working I was working at Harmonix, the first game I did was Amplitude, which those games are kind of similar to Thumper in a lot of ways. You're moving down a, a path and then there's, it's a, a music game, so there's objects coming at you on the path and you're interacting with them. Uh, in such a way that the um, the gameplay creates music or it, it somehow represents a song or something like that. But I felt like in those games, there was a, just, they were, f the fiction was uh, confusing to me. Uh, you know, I, I, just as a piece of art, I like it when things are very, very simple. And I, I like a lot of early games when you think of like Pac-Man or Space Invaders where just everything, everything that's happening on screen is the game. And there isn't like, at least with those, those games at Harmonix, there was like, there was the game that you're playing and then there's a sort of visual representation of what the game means going on behind you, meaning there's like gems and a path and you're, uh, you know, you're trying to interact with these gems as they're coming towards you. And then there's a guy playing guitar that uh, is, the, is supposed to be the fiction. And I just wanted to try to make, take this music game mechanic that the people have done so much with, but just try to distill it down to something that's very pure, emotionally and conceptually. There's not a lot of like, there's no hand waving, there's no explaining to the player what's going on. The sounds are all explained. You know, all the sounds that happen are physically uh, one object colliding with another object. Um, there's j basically that, I guess, just like that the, the physics of the world and the tone of the world, like the fact that you're trying to do this stuff to survive and that you can actually die that you're a physical being in this in this uh, uni this certain universe, and it has there's a mood that it conveys. I just wanted it all to be very uh, simple and constrained and um, distilled to this to as pure an I pure an idea as possible. That, that so that was like the thing that was like it, I wanted to see. I wanted to try to take that to an extreme, and it was something that if I tried to describe it in words to people, 
I didn't even really know exactly what what it meant. I I knew that was the direction it should go. Um, so it was it was something that you couldn't really verbally describe to people. I don't know. But you are now very clearly verbally describing it. Was that something that you could do also then? Or is it something that you only can do right now? Yeah, I could do it then, but you can't... You, I, I just never felt like I could convince people why that's better. Or it was, it was hard... To, and I'm not saying it's better. I, I guess I'm... This is, it's something I wanted to see, and it's something that I think has value, and it's something that should be explored. But I would say this stuff, and there were other people where I worked that were sympathetic to, to that line of thinking, but it's another confounding factor is the, the, how it fits into their sort of profit agenda, and like it, it was, it's difficult to describe something you're passionate about because it's artistically pure, and, but really you need to make a case for why it would sell to the general public, and that doesn't always go together, but I, um, I'm idealistic, so I feel like, no, people want good art, or they want things that are, you know, they want something that is refined and distilled to something that's like coherent and simple. What I, first, what I also find really fascinating about this, that it, it, it's, I have the feeling of that the game has such a... I, I, I'm wondering if uh, for you being a musician and, 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 and uh, making art with something that is highly unconscious on some level and, and very emotional and... and, and which needs something to be into and and such things, if that helps develop such a game where it's yeah where it's also like I, I have the feeling of that it's, it it has something it, it it's it's music in a way the game itself is uh, you are not like working with music like a lot of other games we already know but you are really like like you you achieved I think with the game something what is very I don't know how to say it in a good words, but but what's really hard to describe in in, yeah. in, 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 in in sentences and in words, uh, and if, if if this being a musician, <laughs> and and knowing how to communicate with your partner and how to how to achieve something, but is not really clearly um, communicatable as as a yeah. vision, if that helps. Yeah. Uh I know, I know exactly what you're trying to say, and I, w I want to be more articulate than I am because I want to be able to describe some of this stuff that I think about music because I do play music a lot, and I have my own opinions about what's valuable culturally about music. And uh, this was a <laughs> another thing with like Guitar Hero and, and those games that I was working on that just kind of rubbed me the wrong way. I felt like it was celebrating a kind of old notion of what music is supposed to be based on sort of Western, this, these sort of Western cultural ideas of like a rock star and you're on stage and the musician is, is this powerful being who's like, who makes music and everybody, you know, everybody sort of worships them and and it's just like, why, the reason why it feels good is because your ego is being gratified because you're a rock star and that kind of stuff. To me, just bothered me because I really do love playing music and I have a hard time on stage. I don't really enjoy being on stage. It's not something I'm comfortable with personally. And, uh, you know, I, I want, for me, music is like, it's a social interaction with people, and and it's it's like a feedback loop, and you are doing things that convey an emotional. It's a, like a sort of emotional gesture towards people, and then people respond, and you're sort of communicating in this in this like subconscious language, and it's mysterious, and and uh, and it's a. It's a path that you can go down through like repetition and rhythm and sort of lose yourself 
and go into another state of consciousness. And I have this uh, you know, idealistic view of what music means for human culture. Like I just think it's a, it's a way that we get closer to each other and we lose our egos. And it's not about the rock star, it's about everybody together sort of having this shared experience. But um, it's hard to describe, but, the, but like there's a lot of that in this. Like there's a lot of my um, personal, so it's, you know, Thumper isn't really, uh, it's not a music game in that you're playing songs, but it is, it's like a, trying to recreate what I think is, or it's trying to share something, a relationship with music that I think is deeper and more satisfying with other people. But it's its, its own thing, the, the music and the gameplay together it's not music and it's not a game, it's, it's something else. And, and there's no word for it, but that's, I mean, that's, I guess that's how I, I think about it. I mean, playing your game, I was, I mean, we have talked about it, about this already, but I was really high reminded about this, I don't know how well you know this, but this abstract uh, film concepts of the early 20s, for example, from Oscar Fischinger, where he is like experimenting with uh, visual visual music, uh, that, that, that was the term for that. And I was, when I played the game, I was immediately reminded of this kind of combination between music and visuals and here additionally interaction. And it, 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 it was nice what you said before, because you said you used the word pure and uh, um, like, 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 I don't know in which, which regards, but you used, used pure pureness uh, for, for describing your own game. But, uh, um, I think Oscar Fischinger and other people were in the late in the in the early 20s uh, 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 thinking about film and this visual music stuff that they are, are developed as pure cinema. I think that was the term for it uh, to say that that is pure cinema. And uh, I'm if I look at the game, I'm always had the feeling of that's pure game. <laughs> That's, that's like, it, it, it's strange because it refers to something historical, but you have here like a pure gaming experience where the experience itself is music without audio being songs or music as we usually know. Yeah. Um, that was not a question. I know, yeah. I, I, <laughs> Sorry. I, I feel bad. I hope I'm not being too... I, I like, I'm really idealistic, and so I, I'll talk about this kind of stuff in a way that's not really true to what the game... There's a lot of compromises you have to make when you're making a game, but I'm still, I'm still kind of hung up on the original thing of like what, what was like motivating me the whole time, and I have a lot of idealism uh, that like motivates me. Like There's something that I'm trying to get to that's perfect, and I, I know it never gets close to that, but like that's the thing. Like there's, there's something that's, there's something out there. There's some solution to this puzzle where um, the puzzle of, of like the music game, people have been trying different music games, but there's a perfect one out there. And I'm, and I'm not at all saying that uh, this comes close to even achieving that, but, um, but it's fun to think about that. And I, I do th the like Oscar Fischinger stuff, or I was um, with Mark, the programmer that I work with, we were looking at like early Norman McLaren films and he like draws on the soundtrack and draws on the film directly and there's just, you're just, I just love that, the purity, kind of the pure relationship between um, the audio and the visuals that you're seeing. I, uh, I think early on, before we really knew what the game was going to be, we were thinking about that kind of stuff, like what is the like, game norm what what's the norman mclaren of, of like music games or something or how and back then i remember talking to him about like can we actually like we never did this but like have our own build our own synths inside this world and have the tie all of the values to the waveforms and the um all the curves and everything to the actual like angles of of objects in the world and, and just try to not, not make the game sound good, not have it be, not have the goal be good music, just something true, you know, something that's like, 
um, what's the word? It, it just had, it, it's, yeah. it's got some, I don't know how to say it. It's, but like everything makes sense and that's more important to me than, than it actually sounding good or looking good. I mean, it's really hard things to talk about, so that's why I'm trying to, to, to yeah, to, to talk about this kind of a vision, which is, I think, in the game development world, a uh, highly used uh, buzzword for you need a vision and you need a clear vision from the beginning on and you, uh, you, you need to stick to that from the beginning on. And I find it highly interesting that I, I have the feeling of, yeah, you had that. <laughs> But that's really like something. But vague, but you know? yeah. But strong. <laughs> yeah. That's the opposite. But I, I have the feeling of. I mean, that, that you need something, but 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 it's there, and what is maybe really so difficult to communicate, but you have it. And and uh, I was always wondering how, for you, being a musician, helped to. Yeah, to, 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 to use this for seven years of game development for something which is, yeah, yeah which, uh, for, for a game which is music in the end. Uh, maybe I would so like It's almost to... questionable if it's music. I mean, I, I, the way Thumper sounds is, is uh, it's got drums it, and it's got some melodies and some, but it's, it's very, yeah, it's not, it's weird. It's, it's musical, but, but not, it's almost not sometimes. I mean, it's how, it depends on how you define. Yeah, I, I, I think it's also interesting to see that you 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 have also released the music, the soundtrack of the game, and I also think that's 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 something really interesting to see that the soundtrack itself. I don't know how, who who knows that, but uh, that the soundtrack itself is not not music out of the game, but somehow inspired by the game and inspired by the soundtrack. Of course, inspired is a, not the right terminology because <laughs> you, 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 you did both, but uh, um, there you see that this is a game where the music happens not on the soundtrack side, but on, on between the interaction, the visuals yeah. and the music. Yep. How was it for working, for example, on the music, on, on the soundtrack? Well, th yeah, I mean, it was, there are two different goals with the game, the priority was the gameplay, and and it's sort of like this Norman McLaren thing. Like the uh, the music was just going to be a byproduct of the gameplay, and it didn't need to be good music. It just needed to reflect what was going on in the world in a way that was communicating things clearly, and it's and it sounded interesting. But like um, I wasn't. I wasn't writing songs and then building gameplay around that. We were building gameplay and then, um, and then trying to not even build songs around it, just building a system where the gameplay leads to a musical experience. Um, with the soundtrack, I took all of the loops and the samples that um, I was using in the game and I just assembled them in Fruity Loops, that's what I was working in. And, uh, and then added little, you know, I tastefully planted little um, samples and other things to just make it sound more like songs. Uh, but yeah, that was, those were, that was making the soundtrack, I was composing songs using the, the um, loops and samples that I used to make the game, but it's pretty different. It's kind of similar. Um, I, st I still wanted the soundtrack to kind of reflect the character of the game and the, the weird type of rhythms and, and textures and stuff that happen as a sort of emergent property of all the gameplay happening in the game. Uh, I would like to, to go more into the direction of the whole exhibition and, and, and try to talk about certain features and how they developed uh, over time. And for example, I think it's highly interesting also to see that you, you started as, as, as with, with a lot of game structures, with, with lives and health yeah. and, uh, and dying and uh, a lot of elements which were then, after a while, taken away 
and then in the end <laughs> it comes back again in, uh, in, in, in some way. So, so, so I have the feeling of that you have like a very game-like beginning, <laughs> then you will try to find out the essence, <laughs> and then you are adding again the game-like layers additionally. Was it something that happened consciously in a way, or is just accident? Uh, it was, you know, we're just, we're so inexperienced, and I don't know if we did another game, it would, the same thing would happen, but I know we started probably like having never made a game before, wanting, to, wanting this to feel like a game right away, so we added some lives, and we, we, you know, we created a scenario where you could die, and we just, we just wanted to like have a game, and we weren't very creative. <laughs> In, in that respect, like we just we just put in the things most games have, you know. Um, but then I think once we saw that and once we played around with it, we were like, oh, we're so uncreative. We're being so like, we're just doing the top card idea, the first first idea that comes to our head. Let's try to think of some weird things. Let's take all that stuff out. Let's let's do some weird stuff. And then we would do some weird things, and it would just become like totally incoherent. And people we'd have people play it, and they wouldn't know what's going on or it would seem kind of aimless or um, ungrounded, and then we would be like, oh, okay, let's put back lives, or let's, there's a lot of just like, I mean, the, it just fails on so many levels for the first bunch of iterations, and I think we were always just scrapping a bunch of things and trying a bunch of completely different things, and it kind of was va vacillating back and forth between being like a very traditional game, and 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 then we would like, rebel against that and do some experimental thing. Um, but yeah, it, just chaos. <laughs> it's just chaotic. <laughs> I mean, also looking at the development process, it's like, uh, uh, I, you have, I mean, it's, 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 I mean, you needed seven years, so that's like, uh, it's, it's strange to talk about this in terms of years, but in, uh, I have the feeling of that in the first four years or three, you are just like, searching for the structure of the game it's like it's like you are you are in the in the first levels i don't know how you played it uh, but it's like very open world structures we can drive around and 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 have different ways uh, uh then there are experiments with uh, with this highly sequencer like logic where you are building up a song through different where you have to play good and then it gets more faster and with more visual elements and this is uh, uh, then you have the completely linear stuff where you can't really die, but where the where the corners and the the the, um, the track itself is, is structured like a rhythm with different elements on that. And mm -hmm. you, but you are very widely changing between these different versions. And then after a while, you 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 ha you have the version uh, where you are just like uh, from that point on, and we it's stick. like again three years additionally. <laughs> You are more refining the whole stuff. So I but wonder. I, I'm always wondered, what was the, how does it feel like to 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 be as wild with experiments in this first phase? And what was the big step for you in the in these first three years when you said, now we have it. <laughs> that that's what that's what I like. It, the game, if. For those of you who've seen all of the iterations, the engine was being built, the, the graphics engine and the engine, all the le level editor tools that we were making were all bu being built at the same time as we, as I was like developing some of the art and the, um, the, the music. Everything was, everything was simultaneously progressing in this way that it's kind of hard to tease out what, you know, if, if we were working in Unity and we had like a fully, fully realized graphics engine from the very beginning, it would be easy to see like where, what the design choices were that were like that we were sticking with. It just, I think, I think actually a big thing that that uh, got us to a point where we weren't really iterating too much more on the design was, and I don't know if this is a good, maybe this is a good time to show the level editor, but. Um, I think the level editing tools and a lot of the tools in the engine, once they, they got to a place where uh, it just, that stuff felt finished, 
somehow like we really quickly were able to get the gameplay where we were like, okay, this is good. I don't know. It's confusing because there's just so many moving parts all uh, simultaneously. But I, I feel like uh, a really critical thing that's hard to see from from those um, all those different versions is how the level editor changed and how we got to this point where it became so effective and we were able to refine things so quickly and, and iterate on things so quickly. It just, it kind of, it, it, everything moved much more quickly and we could kind of like stick to a, a single idea. How did you communicate it during the development? Did, did you use some, I'm, I'm, for me it's like quite obvious that you didn't, but uh, did you use some kind of documentation or, or it was just like email conversation? It was, or? yeah, pretty much all email. And then once a week or twice a week, we would Skype and for did like an hour. I mean, uh, uh, we have the level editor here, so uh, maybe you can show it around, but uh, uh, for maybe your first question, but wh when, when did the level editor happen? What was the, what was the state of the game when, where you started to use this editor? Um, I can't remember the year. It, it was, there was that one level where everything is procedurally advancing, like you do a perfect phrase and then we had this kind of, um, I can't remember when that was, 2014 maybe, or, or 2013, but uh, we had uh, that version where if you're playing perfectly, the track just procedurally gets more complex and layers sort of build on top of themselves. It was the version after that where I think we finally created this level editor that was, we had actually been talking about having it for a long time before and it was something Mark I think spent a long time sort of building on the side and then finally when it was ready, we just started, it was almost like we just started making the real game. But um, there, were, there were still a bunch of design decisions that we had to make, but I can, I can show that um, level editor because it's kind of interesting to see how that works. It's just right in the back. <clears throat> How did that go in? Um, this, the, this is kind of the coolest thing about the game, and I'm sad that we didn't show the iterations of the level editor, um, because the reality is that we talked more about about the tools that we were going to use to build the game than, than the game itself. And we both kind of shared, Mark and I shared this opinion that, that uh, having the right tools was going to make the game good. And if, if it's something where like you're able to quickly make design, you know, quickly edit and make design choices and it's it's loose and it feels easy to do, then you're just gonna be able to be more creative. And, and if it's like cumbersome and the tools you have are, I mean, in the beginning we were actually like authoring levels by, by putting dots and dashes on a text, on like a, on a word file. And it was just like so tedious and cumbersome and hard to edit. Um, so like, I think this stuff is is really interesting <laughs> that we that we made, and it's it's really Mark that made all this stuff. I kind of gave him feedback and helped d design it with him, but I don't. I think it's really cool. Um, so you know, here's here's the game. Like in our engine, you can play. You can play the game, and this is level six, and. You can see there's this list here. There's this sort of, we call this the sequin master, and we have this sequence of levels inside level six. And basically the game is going through each of these levels one by one. Here's a boss right here. I don't know if you guys can see the arrow. But um, I'll open up one of the, the levels, or I'll find out which level. Maybe uh, I should have plug in my mouse. Okay, 
Okay. Um, so, so I pressed F6, and that's so I can pause the game. So right now we're at a on a level called Drums Long Pattern Three Three. So I'll just go to that pattern, which is right here. No pictures. Just kidding. I don't care. It's okay. <laughs> this is proprietary. Uh, so, so I just opened drums long pattern three three. That's that's the level right here, and you can see that it's actually a sequence of patterns that are arranged. And if you know, if I play the game, you can see that it's the, uh, the timeline. It's moving along the sequence, and each of these sequences I can open and. This is all of the level, this is the data of that sequence, so there's, um, we have these weird names for all the objects that you interact with, but basically there's this grid which represents, the length is 24 beats, so it's like this is a 24 beat long section of path, and on any given beat I can author various gameplay elements, including, you know, additional paths where it becomes a multi-lane and um, so so to author one of these things we actually have these like this like level test level thing so I could let's say I could go into some random level here I'll go into jagged pattern 4-3 um, so now it's now it's looping, oh, this is a really long one. Let me find a shorter one. Okay, short pattern two. Okay, so, uh, so here's a bunch of sequences in short pattern two, and I can actually test one of those individual sequence. So uh, this is a uh, this is one of the sequences inside that level. And it's called drums short pattern 2. So if I was working on this, I would open up this sequence if I wanted to change something. And I could like take out all of this stuff. And every time I like make a change, it restarts, which is there's a there's a good reason for that. But I don't know what it is. Get there. I'm just removing everything. <laughs> so now this is this is like this is what a sequence looks like with nothing on it. But so it's just these really cool. It's really robust. Like you can do anything to this sequence. Um, like here, one of the traits that we have is pitch, which is how much up, how much of an up or down slope there is on the path. So I could I could make this like you know 90. So the path is sloping up at 90 degrees over the course of 24 beats. But I could also change the duration of this so it's like uh, it goes 90 degrees over the course of 6 beats. And so now over 6 beats you go up and then it does this thing. Um, and turns work the exact same way where I can add a turn keyframe and, you know, say make it 90 degrees and this is 90 degrees over the course of three beats but I could stretch that out or compress it to any length that I want so that's if it's 90 degrees over a really long period then each step becomes more obtuse so like you know now it's you can open this up and see that every Every step in this 24-beat sequence is now a 10-degree has a 10-degree bend, 
So it's not enough for it to be an actual turn, it's just kind of a bend in the path. But if I, uh, you know, if I tighten it up so it's really sharp turn now, now over two beats it's, you know, 45 plus 45 adds up to 90. But, you know, I, get, I, I feel like step sequences are this really magical <laughs> tool in music, and it was fun to try to come up with this sort of step sequence or gameplay authoring system. And, you know, maybe other people have done this kind of thing before. Um, this is maybe is a really common sort of modular way of authoring certain types of levels, but... Uh, What you also have here is, like, it, it looks like an uh, instrument. <laughs> it's like if, 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 I, if I compare this to some kind of digital music making tools, it has highly. It's, it's really borrowing from that. Yeah. No, yeah, we were thinking a lot about just music making tools and trying to make a gameplay authoring tool that worked the way step sequencers work. Um, that m it's just really powerful to have this modular system where you can make these short sequences, dig into like, you know, just a small section of like 12 or 16 or 24 beats, and then make copies of those, make tweaks on the copies, and just really quickly be able to produce huge amounts of gameplay really fast. How was the communication with Mark regarding the development of the editor? Was it like, did you talked about what you want to have. Yeah, I, I just feel just really delivered. lucky working with Mark because he he just sort of got, I mean, he had really good intuition about what a good tool would be. Um, I felt like whenever we talked to each other about this tool stuff, we would agree. Um, he was always thinking a lot more about like what would be efficient and how, you know, how to keep things optimized and what's going to the GPU and just, he, he was, he's always thinking about a million things that I'm not even conscious of. So I always felt like when I would ask for something I'd want or when we would discuss something, he would have a lot more going on in his brain. Like there's a lot of factors that he was considering that I didn't have to worry about, but, um, but he had really good intuition about the, <laughs> the power of a good modular level editing system and how important that would be for us to make as a two-person team a huge amount of content like a full game you know if we didn't have a tool that was fast and easy and modular it it would just multiply the workload for me like a hundredfold so um I mean, it looks like a perfect division for me at least that you you, you are you are in these two very highly divided positions and working together in a very nice and effective way for for a long time because yeah, I, also yeah. if I look at the development of the game and I would really recommend to, to lo look at this uh, but I think for the last three years more or less you are just like refining all these thousands of small steps by one one by one so I really I, I was very fascinated about how many small changes you made in the on, on, on your along your track along the whole level system of, of, of Thumper. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it was um I don't know, I guess we both just enjoyed doing what we were doing and Mark I think Mark really he loves programming. I think he, it's just what he would wanna do all day, every day anyway, so um, how much how about the testing or was it like you and testing the, 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 the game by yourself or did you went out and get we, some feedback? It wasn't until til the last couple of years that we got really serious about testing and I think we had just been burned so many times by our own brains getting excited about what we had and then showing it somewhere and people would not be getting certain things and it would be really frustrating to watch and I think we had been watching like talks seeing other game developer talks and like getting more exp I was both of us were getting more experience at harmonics or you know seeing how the corporate in the corporate world the testing is like this really important element 
Um, and you have to be very dispassionate and unemotional about getting feedback from people and just accepting it as that's, that's as objective as you're ever going to get in terms of information about how well your game is working. So you have to submit to it and not get upset about it and not, not be attached to what you have. And we, I think we got more and more disciplined about that, dis, that approach. And I think as the game, we started to realize it was getting closer to the time when we need to start wrapping it up, we started to really take testing seriously. Most of our testing was, um, was actually showing it at conferences and like having a line of people that were playing it and then writing down wherever they got stuck or wherever people seemed to get bored and walk away. And uh, we, we showed it at a lot of conferences and then afterwards we would have a big list of notes that we would share with each other and we would just sort of go through and we, just, we would just like treat all of the all of the misinterpretations people had, all of the problems people would have, we just, we treated them as bugs. We didn't argue with it. Um, we were just like, this doesn't work, or people are bored here, we have to change it. And over time, all of those, especially in the first level, that first tutorial section, that's like, maybe it's like a 20 minutes of tutorial, the first level, that really got refined to a point where it's like 90, you know, over 95% of people that play it seem to just stick with it all the way to the end, which, you know, it used to be, there were times when it was 5%, you know, people would pick up the game and sort of stare at it or not really know what to do. And we had to add things like overt tutorial messaging and stuff like that to just really communicate to people, this is what you do now, you know, this is exactly what you're supposed to do now, and then find ways of building up the, the complexity and the, um, making the gameplay more interesting at a pace that's not, not too challenging. It's just, just in that right zone where, where people always feel like it's, uh, it's like giving them a little more than they expected, but they always can manage to get, get through it without dying a, you know, more than five times. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, looking at the last versions of the game and really like the last five that we have in the exhibition, you also can see that how you are refining all the visual clues about gameplay elements. Because uh, I, I don't know, but there's the, the elements where you have to, which you have to avoid, the elements which you have to use for something, the elements which you have to jump on. And it's, it's also n nicely visible that uh, in the beginning they were all quite similar and, and, and uh, you approached it to to yeah to make it very distinguishable during uh, th this this last two years maybe yeah what was your I mean you were also responsible for this kind of elements but what was the how how did you approach this uh, I, I I think it's quite fascinating also to look at the development of the Beatle for example what what kind of uh, I mean there is a lot of gameplay elements in the Beatle which developed over seven years and got more and more and more perfect till the end where it works quite nice. This again was not a question. That's yeah, well, there, there's, I mean, the, the chrome, the black and white chrome reflection on the beetle, so much of this stuff was just like, I'm gonna try this texture, I'm gonna try this kind of chrome, I'm gonna make it look like this, but I, um, I arrived at the, I think right now the beetle like is, is very much the center of attention on the screen and I think it's because it's, it's like the only grayscale element. Everything has color, but the beetle is like grayscale. And so on the level of color, it's completely different from everything else. And it's also very, it's more high contrast. It has white and super bright brights and dark darks next to each other. Um, so over the course of trial and error, there was a point where the beetle always had that sort of darker look that when I opened the wings, the, the inside part of the beetle, it always kind of had that look and it just never was as bold. I think, I think one thing I, I learned because I never was, I never actually made the art, all the art for a game and I, I was always making effects at harmonics, so I never, 
had a lot of experience with like using art to communicate things clearly and a lot of one thing that just really w took a while to learn and I, I don't think I, I still think I haven't learned it um, was that things have to be so bold and so distinct from each other if you're if there's some gameplay cue that's coming that's different from another gameplay cue it has to look very very different at least in this game I mean this is this is my experience with Thumper where everything's moving very fast but um you know I I tried really hard to and I learned that I had to make every element that's distinct in the game look completely different from every other element. And I, that's maybe a little vague, but uh, it's like I, you know, these things that you grind through, these little sticks that are in the path and you have to sort of slide through them. They used to be these, and you can see in some of the other versions, there are these like gems that are in the path. And they, they just looked, to me, when I was making it, I was like, oh, these are, these are the gems, like people will recognize that this is a different kind of cue, but everything's moving so fast and it's a bright thing in the middle of the path. So even if it's green and it's a different shape, a lot of people just thought it was another thing you're supposed to thump. They thought it was another one of these white squares. And, and so I had to do this really overt thing, like make the cue actually break the silhouette of the path because that's, nothing else does that. And so when people see the silhouette of the path being broken, they're like, oh, that's the, the cue to slide through the thing. Um, everything ended up being like that, where anytime there's a new gameplay cue, I had to come up with some, some fundamental reason why it's completely different from everything else. Okay. I would like to open up for some questions. So if uh, there are we would be happy to take. I have no idea. Sorry, I have no idea. Hey, um, I have a question um, regarding the editor because um, for for the the things that. <laughs> Sorry. I, Cheers. I, I'm, yeah. <laughs> it's helping me. Help me get through. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for the for the things that you uh, edited uh, or inserted, like all the graphics um, came automatically or were automatically automatically inserted. So, uh, what's um, about the other visual aspects that you have, like tunnels or those um, those orbs where you can drive through, or like changing of the um, of the background, like the color? Do you do this? in the editor as well, or is this yeah. all like procedural generated by, from the sequence that you do? You know what I mean? Yeah, um, it's actually, everything is, is authored in different, various places. So I just went back to a larger view of the sequence of sequences. So this is, <coughs> oh, my battery. Um, actually, some of there's there's a lot of uh, data that I'm that, so the music stuff. This gets so in depth, and I'll try to just do a quick overview. But um, here you can see the the sequence the sequence of different sub sequences, and this is where I author the tunnels, and I can. I can sort of right click on any of these sequences and then I made all of these various pieces of tunnel geometry and I can change them around. So now I just added a, a different tunnel here and it just lasts for as long as that one sequence, but I could, I don't know what, it, what one was that? That was octoglass path. So I could put octoglass path. Uh, there, and then here, these these are the sample loops. I don't is the 
For some reason, we can't hear the audio, but um, I'm actually, oh, okay. I made all these samples that loop um, at, the, at the BPM of the different levels. Um, so if you listen to, just, if I just make the, well, I, right now there's like a drum loop and then there's like a dissonant pad going over everything. I'll take out the dissonant pad so it's just the drum loop. But right now I have it so this loop is looping every six beats, but I could actually change the length so it's looping every, like change the time signature and have it loop every four beats. I don't know what it would sound like, but um, right now the, the audio is a little hard for me to hear. But in any case, it's on this like wider view that I would, I would offer the sounds and a lot of the decorative visual elements. Um, just because that stuff, a lot of that stuff, I thought um, I wanted it to continue for longer than one sequence most of the time, and I wanted to have, have the ability to uh, make longer sections that are sort of consistent. Okay. Uh, hi, Brian. Uh, Okay, first of all, congrats for building like the perfect VJing synthesizer. I think this thing needs to be like uh, live with people being able to manipulate it and project it on really? big screens. Okay. <laughs> I think. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, my question is uh, different. Like the uh, the thing is a dream to play in VR. Mm. I think it really lends itself very well. How early in the de development process did you uh, start considering the problems of uh, VR locomotion and visual vection? Or did it just, uh, was it made for it, uh, you know? It was made for it. Yeah. And that's, and it's weird because it doesn't, it's, it's unbelievable. It, we thought it would be a, a disaster when we ported it's so it so fast, it feels so dynamic and, you know, yeah. like it's the only game where you actually have the sense of, like, zooming through hyperspace and uh, pff, I'm very sensitive and uh, for sickness and uh, this is great. Yeah, yeah, it was all luck. I mean, we, we made a lot of decisions, creative decisions that just lended themselves to mitigating those things about VR that make people sick. A lot of the, there's some, tons of motion and speed in this game, but it's all very regular. The speed is constant, so there's no, and, the, and all of the motion is kind of mathematically perfect. It's, uh, you're not like doing irregular exponential curves. It's all yeah. these perfectly cir regular yeah. circular curves. Yeah, the rail just underneath and it stays fairly static. I think that's usually a pretty big one for Yep. Driving, racing. Yeah, you games. just feel really grounded. And also the darkening around the edges, you can see how the, um, we have some post processing that sort of darkens all the edges of the screen. That was just done as a, that was a stylistic decision that we made early on. Um, but in VR, a lot of that peripheral, there's a lot of peripheral motion that I think makes people sick as well. And we, yeah, we just, we just got really lucky. It's like this game, was perfectly tailored. Also, thanks for men mentioning normal McLaren. I got goosebumps there. It's like uh, also really? very important to me for uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, he's cool. Hi. Um, I wanted to uh, go back to something you were saying uh, around the start. Um, there was a. I think, I think you were saying something along the lines of uh, that you wanted to sort of convey uh, the feeling of performance, for way. Um, I mean, I, th I think you, you mentioned that you weren't particularly fond of uh, performing um, live uh, so much. And could you, um, would it be okay to maybe talk a little bit about of um, how you felt you brought this into the game? How I felt what? In the How I felt you brought the, the, the element of live performance into this game, um, in a sense. Because uh, my impression was that it um, felt like, it felt a little bit like performance, in that um, there's a certain element of forgiveness to um, uh, the, the, the play uh, where you, you, you thump and there's. Um, maybe a, a half second either side where you're allowed to um, be a little less accurate. Mm -hmm. And that's fairly allowance, allowed for when you're performing live. Um, people say less likely to notice that and things like that. Yeah, specifically what you're talking about is an interesting sort of 
discussion we had at one point where it's like the question is how accurate should people be? How, how accurate should we demand that people be? And I think it, it's pretty clear to me that it's just annoying if, your intention, if you see something coming and your intention is to hit it and you miss it because you weren't on time. We made the window wider and wider so that it, you'd have to be really pretty bad at timing. I mean, everybody kind of messes it up at first, but you have to be pretty bad at timing to, like, to, to see something coming and miss it in this game. And what is more important to me in terms of like live performance is to be able to execute a pattern, with, not necessarily with accuracy, but just to, to execute a pattern, to, to do the right sequence of things, but not necessarily in, with precise timing. And um, because, yeah, with live music, a lot of the time, like good feel or you know, drummers that have like good drum feel you know, if you, if you put that stuff into a, on a grid and you see where they're actually hitting the hi-hats and the kick drums, like, they're not, it's not quantized. It's not people that have good feel or interesting feel. They'll play behind the beat or they'll play in front of the beat. And probably when people are playing these games, they're feeling it in different ways. They have their own, their own sense of where they are. Um, so, the, so the important thing is that they're getting the this, this sort of patterns and they're picking up on those, but to demand that they hit things exactly when they happen is almost flying in the face of what good musicians actually do. Because yeah, like a, I remember, um, I'm not really a drummer, I played drums a little bit, but I remember reading a thing about how like, you know, John, like these great drummers are always like way off. Like what makes them distinct is that they they have a feel, and, the, and what feel means is that they're not on the, they're not actually playing on the grid. They're like, kind of sliding things around. I don't want to crowd you with questions too much, but um, the uh, atmosphere of the game kind of have a had, kind of have a very, it's very dark, it's very terrifying, um, and yeah, it's just going back to the how you mentioned that you're not entirely all that comfortable with live performance. Is that something you're trying to bring across here? Uh, it's the the dark stuff is somewhat arbitrary. I think I really in the beginning when I started working with Mark, I was like, we should really take a stand on how this game makes you feel first. Like it should really let's not have that be a question we're trying to answer for seven years or whatever. Like let's just answer that question now because it's kind of an arbitrary question. Like what. What is, like, so the sooner you answer it, the more time you have to get it right, I guess. That, that was kind of my attitude. And I, I do personally, and this is a, a subject that everybody has their own opinion on, my personal feeling about video games is that they are a stressful experience and that's what's great about them. Or they, they're kind of, they're making your heart rate go up and they're make, causing you to sweat and they're I like that about games, and I, um, so I, I was excited about just trying to make a game that really makes you feel a lot of feelings, you know, and, and it seems like going the dark route is, you could go in other route, you could try to evoke other emotions, but um, it seemed exciting to just go in this dark direction, stressful, the game is trying to stop you, and uh, it's just it's kind of traditional, I guess. It's my turn. Uh oh. <laughs> I have like a dozen questions, but I'll just like annoy you later. The one that I'll mention now is uh, you were saying earlier that um, you feel very idealistic when you were describing a lot of things that you see in music and in games and uh, when you were working with harmonics. And uh, at some point in here, you said that um, you feel like you had to make a lot of compromises when making Thumper. And I was hoping you would talk about that or an example would even be really cool of a time where you had an idea or there was something you wanted to get across in Thumper or just something you wanted to do and then you were like, you had to compromise in some way. Yeah, gotcha. I mean, I, I'm, I don't know if there's a good specific anecdote of that, but the, I mean, the, I guess the most obvious, this is very high level, but the most obvious thing is just having score and 
having an, a rank, which is something I don't care. I just actually personally, when I'm playing it, I just don't care what my rank is so much, you know. But so many people love that, you know, and it's... Mark, I'm, I'm kind of like a dad or something. Like, I, I stopped playing games like 15 years ago. I, I still love those classic Nintendo games. I love, like, classic video games. For some reason, I'm, like, attached to that stuff, and it, it all feels very modernist and, like, conceptually strong to me. <laughs> and, uh, and I feel like um, there's so many brilliant games being made all the time, but I, I feel like the trajectory of games has kind of gone in the, the opposite direction, like they've gotten more... I don't know. They've, they've lost that simplicity. I shouldn't say anything general about games. I, I'm going to get into trouble. But, um, but Mark, Mark, we would often have discussions where Mark would be like, we should put in this ranking stuff because this is what a lot of, a lot of people just want to see this kind of thing. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to appeal to a lot of people. A lot of people will pay attention to the game that will blow it off if we don't do this. We should put in trophies, we, you know, like PS PlayStation trophies, and we should uh, have all of these various things that you're scoring that we're keeping track of, and a lot of people care about that kind of thing. So how do you... Oh. Whoa, hello. So how do you feel when... Uh, I was actually talking to someone about it just earlier today, and he was saying that if he gets through a level and he got Cs on most things, he's like, I feel like I didn't really beat the level. I have to play it over again. Like... How, how do you feel about that? Like people are now, you know, altering how they play the game based on the ranking system. I think it's okay. I'm, you know, you. I'm idealistic, but I'm not like, I'm not uh, dogmatic. And I want, I really want this game to be something that people enjoy, and I want it to to be accessible. And I, I wanted it. I artistically want to satisfy certain desires that I have, but I fundamentally want to make something that people like to play and enjoy and I um, even you know as an artist and talking about the conceptual purity of like Norman McLaren and how Mark and I had early early on talked about like making all of the sounds meaningful based on vi the, just visually what you're seeing in such a way that's very straightforward and and like um, stripped down to the bare bones. I'm not sure what an example, how, how to describe what I'm thinking, but the game is, even the fact that the game is about this beetle and it's like slamming against things and it's like exciting and there's explosions and all that stuff to me is a little bit of a compromise because it, it's a fiction <laughs> and there's a, if I was really going to get, I, I can get idealistic and think about that the whole con that whole purity thing and, and like work myself into like a a corner and just be like the game is just two squares a yellow square and a blue square and this square makes this sound and that's great like I can just like sometimes my brain will want to refine and and uh, break things down into the most pure essence and that's there's a limit to that. There's a point where that becomes not fun for people. It becomes less interesting, but it becomes more artistically pure and more artistically interesting if someone wants to put the work into understanding what you're doing. I don't know if it makes sense, but like the whole thing is compromises in a lot of ways, and I'm happy with it because I want to... I wanna, I want to satisfy some of those idealistic urges I have, but I also want to, at the same time, make a thing that a lot of people respond to that don't care about that stuff. They just want to have a fun game that they're going to play. And um, yeah. We are over time, so one more question, if there is need. Um, hello? What was the main source of excitement that you that you decided on when you were designing the game? The main source of excitement? I don't know. Can you say that in a different way, maybe, or say it in another no, way? I'm not sure when I was when I was thinking about the question if it was going to ask like joy or, or excitement, but like what was just like 
Mm, okay, where I wanted to go with this potentially was, is the timing of the obstacles, is that something that's like, should be really enjoyed by the, by the player or? Well, I think at one point we, we realized what we could do with this game that was going to be really innovative was have a music game because some music games traditionally everything is moving at this constant rate and there's something very weightless about that and I think there's a point where we realized like the big innovation if we're gonna like have an innovation in music games that we're gonna introduce is is sort of tricking people into believing that they're a physical object with mass traveling through real space and colliding with things which you know, should be changing your velocity and doing all these things that defy the whole notion of motion on a gr quantized motion on a grid. Um, and if you play a lot of music games, you'll see what I'm talking about. Like, there's no, everything feels weightless, everything's floating, and it just doesn't feel like you're interacting with real objects. So, we got, and so that, that's why we like had this, the term rhythm violence, because we were like, this is, that's the like, that's the thing that this is that's different from anything else is that it's like physically violent. It's a rhythm game that has like this physical violence to it that um, it's all really just tricks in the effects and we do, we have like little tricks that, that make it so it feels that way but um, you know, it's, it's not. Yeah, yeah because I mean, that's another thing about live music is that, you know, drums are like, they're physical objects and you hit them and it's, there's something substantial about that sensation of making those sounds. And when you're playing a game and you're just pressing a button when two icons intersect and that triggers a sample that doesn't really relate to, the, to what you're seeing on the screen, it doesn't, it doesn't connect in the way that real music connects when you're playing it, which is like that, it's like kind of actually a very primal experience of physically hitting an object or a string or whatever, and it vibrates, creates sound. Um, yeah. That sounds great as a ending. Thank you very much, Brian, for being here.